Hello everyone, it's seven o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. Extraordinary new detail has been revealed overnight about Donald Trump's actions on January the 6th, as the former president watched rioters storming the Capitol from the dining room of the West Wing and ignored the pleas of even his children to tell the mob to leave. He's been accused by the inquiry investigating the attack last year of knowingly failing to act and instead pouring gasoline on the fire. Also, of course, we're going to have all the latest on the Tory leadership election after Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak's first full day of campaigning. I'll be joined by Robert Halfen, who's backing Rishi Sunak, and Graham Stewart, who's backing Liz Truss. It's Friday, the 22nd of July. He chose not to act. Donald Trump accused of knowingly ignoring pleas to call off the rioters during the storming of the US Capitol. The congressional inquiry hears more extraordinary evidence about the former president's actions on January the 6th as he watched the riot unfold on television from a dining room in the West Wing. President Trump did not fail to act during the 187 minutes between leaving the ellipse and telling the mob to go home. He chose not to act. Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss face off in the race for number 10 as a new poll gives the Foreign Secretary a convincing lead. As school holidays get underway, there's a warning that fuel price protesters could bring chaos to Britain's roads. Turkey says a deal has been reached with Russia to allow Ukraine to resume exports of grain. Burnt to the ground, we speak to the villagers in Spain being driven out of their homes by relentless wildfires. President Biden tests positive for COVID, but says he's doing great. And a new photograph of Prince George is released to mark his ninth birthday. Also ahead this morning, we'll be venturing into deep space ahead of the release of a new film exploring the mysteries of asteroids. I'll be joined by a NASA scientist and the film's director. And I'll be joined by the nation's favourite pianist, Jules Holland, to talk about his new concert in aid of the fight against prostate cancer and his personal experience of the disease. Hello and a very good morning to you. Donald Trump has been accused of knowingly failing to act during the storming of the US Capitol as his advisers and even his children urged him to call off the mob. Witnesses at another extraordinary hearing into the events of January the 6th have described the former president instead watching the events unfolding on TV from the dining room of the West Wing. Sky's Sally Lockwood reports from Washington. While this building was under attack on January the 6th, what was Donald Trump doing? The question at the heart of this committee's investigation. Now on primetime television, this hearing laid out what was happening inside the White House. President Trump did not fail to act during the 187 minutes between leaving the ellipse and telling the mob to go home, he chose not to act. This committee revealed new evidence of Trump's inaction as he watched the riot unfold on television from the West Wing. At 2.13, protesters started kicking in the windows of the Capitol building. Shortly after, we see the Vice President Mike Pence being evacuated to safety by the Secret Service. Their radio recordings reveal a sense of panic. If we lose uh, any more time, we may have, we may lose the ability to, to leave. So if we're going to leave, we need to do it now. One White House security official described anonymously how at this point, staffers were beginning to fear for their lives. A lot of very personal calls uh, 
um, over the radio. Uh, there were calls to um, say goodbye to family members, so on and so forth. The mob's anger was directed at the vice president, but Donald Trump does not call on them to stop. Instead, he tweets, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should be done. Then Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews gave unparalleled insight into the president's reluctance to call off the mob. The president did not want to include any sort of mention of peace in that tweet. And it wasn't until Ivanka Trump suggested the phrase, stay peaceful, that he finally agreed to include it. To me, his refusal to act and call off the mob that day and his refusal to condemn the violence was indefensible. A day later, the agonizing and denial continued. The hearing shown outtakes of Donald Trump's video message from January the 7th. Whenever you're ready, sir. My only goal was to ensure the integrity of the vote. Congress has certified the results. I don't want to say the election's over. I just want to say Congress has certified the results without saying the election's over, OK? Dramatic testimony of a desperate president on one of the most extraordinary days in American history. Sally Lockwood, Sky News, Washington. Now, we're going to bring you all the latest on the Conservative leadership election in just a moment. But first, some breaking news for you this morning. And we've got the latest retail sales figures just in. So let's find out what they tell us. Our politics and business correspondent, Amanda Acas, is standing by with all the details. So, Amanda, what are those figures? What do they tell us? Yes, so we can see that the figures are down by 0.1% over the previous month. Um, that's for sales for everything that has been sold in shops and online, fuel, everything else. So overall, a drop of 0.1%. Now, that is actually rather less than had been feared. Uh, the previous month, that drop was 0.8% uh, to the month to May. But obviously, that does cover the period of the Jubilee weekend. Um, and it's suggested by uh, retailers that perhaps that did give it a bit of a bump uh, so it wasn't quite as bad as had been expected given that we know that inflation is obviously um, at record 40-year highs of 9.4% uh, and that was just early this week obviously people tightening the purse strings now overall sales are up slightly where they were before Covid hit us um, back in February 2020 but they did fall um, over the past year um, if we look at online sales particularly they fell by 3.7% um, fuel sales in particular have fallen by 4.3%. Obviously, that's due to the record increase in the price of fuel, up 42% overall. Um, in terms of other kinds of goods, so um, clothing stores, they fell by 4.7%. Household goods, 3.7%. Um, there's a real sense that perhaps people are putting off buying more expensive products, those big items, furniture, kitchens, all of that kind of thing, um, with the real concerns about... Um, the impact of the cost of living crisis and inflation. Um, but I think certainly this figure of overall a 0.1% decrease isn't as much as feared, but it's certainly given that we know that inflation is heading um, to grow even more in coming up in the autumn, in October. We're expecting the Bank of England are expecting it to hit some 11% with the uh, next energy price cap, um, that actually the pain isn't over yet and it certainly looks like it uh, could grow even further before we're done with this. Indeed. Amanda, thanks very much indeed. So let's move to the race for number 10 now. And after the first full day of head-to-head -head campaigning, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss seems to be pulling ahead with a convincing lead over her rival Rishi Sunak in the latest polling. Their campaigns so far have focused on the economy and taxation plans as they vie to win the votes of Conservative Party members. So let's take a look at the latest poll in more detail then. And a YouGov survey of Tory members shows that 62% of the party would favour the Foreign Secretary as leader. That compares to 38% who would back Rishi Sunak. So that's a 24 percentage point lead for Liz Truss. That's up from 22 days before. When the last poll was published on Tuesday, the Sunak campaign argued that they were closing the gap, but this poll suggests otherwise. Well, one of Liz Truss's backers is the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, who said no country in the world had achieved growth by putting up taxes. What she is very credible about is the idea that you can't tax your way to growth. 
No country in the history of the world has ever grown its economy by simply increasing taxes. And I think there's a real fear that we've got the 70-year uh, high in terms of tax uh, uh, take, uh, and that's not something that's sustainable. In fact, Boris Johnson himself uh, indicated uh, only a few weeks ago that he was looking to uh, make those tax cuts, and Liz will, will deliver on that. Well, Rob Powell is here with me now. Good morning to you. So what do you make of this latest YouGov poll? It does give Liz Truss a real advantage, it seems. Yeah, I think it shows pretty clearly at the beginning of the next stage, this members stage of the leadership contest between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. Let's be clear, Liz Truss, as it stands, is the clear favourite. Um, these figures show a, a clear gulf in terms of the members. We should point out 730 members were polled by um, YouGov. So it, it is a fraction of the entire uh, voting um, population, if you like, that will make this decision. But it does show that Liz Truss at the moment is ahead. And I think one other concerning statistic for the Sunak camp is that YouGov also asked these 730 members about whether both candidates could be trusted to tell the truth. Uh, and 40% of the people, those 730 members, who were asked that about Rishi Sunak said they didn't think he could be trusted to tell the truth. Now, the figure for Liz Truss on that was 18%, so half. Uh, and I think when the pitch from Rishi Sunak is about honesty, about saying, look, I know I'm not promising tax cuts immediately, but what I am promising is sort of careful stewardship um, of the economy and honesty about the situation we are in, the fact that that figure is quite so high about trusting whether he's telling the truth, I think will be concerning. Um, again this morning, I think we see what it is going to dominate over the next five or six weeks in the summer. The main battle line being about the economy and being about tax, with Liz Truss promising essentially a, a new approach to handling the economy, a new approach to tax. Rishi Sunak, at the moment, not really putting anything forward uh, on top of the previous policies that he put in when in the Treasury. Now, we will have to see whether he has anything in the coming weeks to sort of bring out of his pocket, if you like, to try and convince Tory members, because I think judging by these poll numbers, he needs to bring something out. Interesting stuff. Rob, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's get a view on this then, shall we? The Conservative MP and Chair of the Education Select Committee, Robert Halfen, joins me now, and he's backing Rishi Sunak. So, Robert Halfen, um, I don't know if you were listening just then, but a pretty uncomfortable poll for Rishi Sunak uh, by YouGov of party members. It gives Liz Truss a 24-point lead over the man you're backing. I mean, does he have much of a hope now? Hope now. Well, the first thing I'd say is I'm backing uh, Rishi Sunak because he's trusted in a crisis. Uh, he developed the furlough scheme, which saved millions of jobs and businesses around the uh, country. He's being responsible about the economy, not making promises that he can't keep. We've got to cut inflation and cut the debt. Then we can cut the cost of living and cut taxes in the, in the future. And also, when it counts, he has cut the cost of living by cutting taxes, national insurance tax for 70% of the uh, most uh, uh, vulnerable households around the country. He's cut, uh, he's uh, 8 million uh, of the most vulnerable households again to get up to 1,200 pounds uh, back to help them with the cost of living. So on those three things, trust uh, on the economy, trust to deal in a crisis, trust to help with the co cutting the cost of living, I think Rishi Sunak is the right person uh, to help uh, to help our country to be leader of our country. That's so interesting that you talk about trust and trust in a crisis, because a lot of people would say we are in a crisis, we're in a cost of living crisis right now, and yet he polls really badly on trustworthiness. Uh, four in ten say that Rishi Sunak can't be trusted to tell the truth. He, he polls much worse than, than Liz Truss. So why do you think that is? I think there are all kinds of different polls. So, for example, there was a poll out over last weekend which said that over 70% of seats that were won by the Conservatives in 2019 uh, supported Rishi Sunak over other uh, candidates. So polls come and polls go. Um, the important thing is that the public know uh, that when it counted, uh, Rishi Sunak developed the furlough scheme, did everything possible during the pandemic and saved millions of jobs and has also done everything possible to help cut the cost of living as well. But don't Tory members know all that? They've been watching the news. They've heard his pitch uh, as far as um, resisting tax cuts as well. And his 
argument is, I'm telling the unpalatable truth. He says we can't afford tax cuts, but people still don't trust him. Why is that pitch not working, do you think? Um, very, in very early days of the uh, contest at the moment, it's only just, uh, we've only just finished the MP elections and uh, the former chance is going to be going around the country, meeting members, there'll be hustings. I believe that when the, chan uh, the former Chancellor Richard Sunak makes his case that more members will come and uh, support him because they know uh, that it, he's not making promises that he can't keep. And that's the important thing. If he wanted to be popular, he could say uh, everything and anything about tax cuts. But we've got to deal with the uh, the debt. Debt interest alone is £80 billion plus over the uh, coming uh, year. We've got a huge problem with inflation. Our prices are going up in the supermarkets. Everybody knows that things are difficult. Inflation is the number one enemy of the cost of, of living. And, and the Chancellor says we've got to get to grips with debt and inflation. Cut debt, cut inflation, and we can cut uh, uh, the cost of living over the coming uh, months. OK, uh, and I want to come back to, to his plans on the economy in just a moment, but just one more question on this issue of trust. Is it, do you think, that the Tory membership thinks that he stabbed Boris Johnson in the back and they don't like him for that? I, th I don't think that's the case at all. Um, Rishi Sunak was very loyal to the Prime Minister. He resigned when he thought things had just gone too far. He had differences with the Prime Minister over the economy, uh, but he was there to, uh, almost till the very, very end. Um, he was loyal um, right through the party gate uh, episode. In fact, there, another MP went to see him and he refused to countenance any kind of uh, disloyalty to the, to the Prime Minister. I think what people want to know um, is what is the Prime Minister going to do, the next Prime Minister going to do for our our country? How um, is he going to stabilise our economy, uh, cut the cost of living, cut our debt, uh, deal with the many other problems we face um, in education and health? And, and I think okay. people want to look forward rather than discuss what's gone on in the past. OK, well, well let's look forward then. Liz Truss says that Rishi Sunak has put taxes up to a 70-year high and has choked off growth. I mean, she's got a point, hasn't she? I don't accept that narrative at all. Yes, he did put up a uh, corporation uh, tax, but don't forget, we we spent £400 billion during uh, COVID. I mentioned the £80 billion of, of debt uh, uh, interest that we have. We're £2 trillion in debt overall. You know, you have to pay some of that money back. But he also cut taxes, and this is important, cut national insurance tax for 70% of households. He also cut business taxes for hospitality, retail and leisure by 70 Taxes billion. overall are at a 70 year high, aren't they? Because we spent £400 billion uh, during COVID, we have to pay that money back. It doesn't, the money doesn't grow on trees. The Chancellor has to be responsible, but he's cut taxes, national insurance tax, 70% of households, cut hospitality, retail and business taxes uh, but uh, we're using £7 billion of money in order to uh, uh, do so. He also, uh, overall, spent £37 billion on a cost of living package. So, as I mentioned, um, 8 million of the most vulnerable households will get up to £1,200 uh, back. Everybody will get a £400 rebate on their energy bills. Fuel duty was cut by uh, 5 pence. So what he has done is focus tax cuts and cost of living uh, help with the cost of living on the most on lower earners and the most vulnerable in our societies but at the same time recognizing that because of the debt because of inflation we have to pay that debt back somehow and that's why uh, he had to do what he did with corporation taxes Liz Truss says that she wants to cut taxes because it would boost growth where are Rishi Sunak's big ideas for boosting growth that there aren't any are there well, that's the case. The Chancellor's talked about um, growth. First of all, in order to have growth, you've also got to cut inflation and deal with the debt. And you can't just wish this away. We also have to spend money on public services. So 
if you don't uh, uh, just i mean if you, i go back to that 80 billion figure just imagine if we had 80 billion pounds to spend on public services and uh, tax cuts but we have to pay that back because it is the interest uh, of the debt that we owe the huge amount the two trillion pounds overall but he uh, that Rishi Sunak has talked about uh, innovation investments in the economy education he's done a lot already on skills he rocket boosted the apprenticeship program he's invested two billion pounds to increase our skills base because we have a huge amount of adults in our country with um, illiteracy and innumeracy uh, difficulties. So the Chancellor, when it counts, cuts the cost of living, but is doing so responsibly, but is also investing in our economy uh, in skills, as I've just described. Isn't this kind of more of the same? It's continuing the job he was doing as Chancellor. I mean, he talked earlier this week about being the heir to Thatcher and promising to deliver radical reforms. We haven't had any radical reforms, have we? What are they going to be? Well, Margaret Thatcher also uh, uh, reduced the uh, debt and actually had to increase taxes um, when, when she got in, when the economy was in a, a very difficult place way back in the uh, 1980s. And Margaret Thatcher talked about good housekeeping. You can't spend what you don't have. And that is what the Chancellor is going to do, to reduce inflation, um, to invest in our economy, to invest in skills and education. I think that is the right approach rather than having unfunded tax cuts when you need to reduce the debt, fund our public services and make sure that we get inflation under control. You're chair of the Education Select Committee. Are you concerned that Liz Truss's plans for the economy could mean that spending on schools will fall? Well, it's up to um, other candidates, Liz Truss or whatever, to set out her own spending proposals. But I care deeply about education and we need to fund our schools and our colleges and our universities. And this goes back to the argument I've been making throughout this interview that you can't just have unfunded tax cuts because you have to deal with the debt. We have to spend money on the public services, whether it be the NHS, education, and many other areas in public life. And if we have to, if we're going to have a proper education service, that needs to be uh, properly uh, resourced. So if you just have unfunded tax cuts, where is that money going to be for vital public services? Would Liz Truss make a good prime minister? Look, I'm very proud that uh, all the candidates who stood for leadership have have talent. And of course, I'm sure <clears throat> um, that she would make a good prime minister, but I'm supporting uh, Arushi Sunak because he's trusted in a crisis. He's going to be responsible about the economy and cut inflation, cut debt, and then we'll be able to do work to cut the cost of living. Um, but he's also helped uh, the public wh when it counts, uh, particularly those who are uh, lower earners and more vulnerable, the, those people who are more vulnerable across our country. Robert Halfen, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much indeed for talking to us this morning. Thank you. And a reminder that a head-to-head -head, uh, debate is going to take place here on Sky News and a live televised debate between the two candidates. Kay Burley will be hosting the programme on Thursday the 4th of August at 8pm. So don't forget about that one. Let's take a look now at all the stories that are making the front pages of the newspapers this morning. And The Telegraph is reporting that Rishi Sunak has insisted that if he becomes Prime Minister, he won't cut taxes until late next year. And it's the same story in The Guardian, which also reports that polling shows Liz Truss is well ahead of Mr Sunak. The Times reports that the two candidates are trading blows over tax pledges. Mordaunt's revenge. The Eye says that Penny Mordaunt supporters intend to mount a campaign to stop Miss Truss getting the top job. The Metro leads with the BBC's apology in court to the former royal nanny Tiggy Leg Borg over the corporation admitting that its former journalist Martin Bashir lied about her to Princess Diana in order to secure his now famous interview. And it's the same headline in The Star, We Let Diana Down. And this is The Express, which says the BBC issues an apology over what it calls shameful panorama smears. The Mirror quotes Diana's brother, calling for criminal charges against the people responsible for the wrongdoing in the case. 
And the Financial Times reports that the European Central Bank has raised interest rates by half a point. That's the first increase since 2011. Do stay with us. Still to come on the show, I'm going to be joined by a Democrat strategist to get more reaction to the Capitol riots hearings. And with the country set to embark on an estimated 90 million journeys by car as the school summer holidays start this weekend, I'll be speaking with the RAC about what we should expect on the roads. Plus, I'll be joined by Shadow Policing Minister Sarah Jones to get her party's take on the Conservative leadership race. So fuel price protests are set to unleash chaos on major roads as millions of families head off on their summer holidays. An estimated 18.8 .8 million leisure trips are planned by, in the UK between Friday and Monday as authorities warn of widespread disruption. Well, Madeleine Ratcliffe joins us now from close to the M4 where protesters have said they are going to target. Uh, so a huge number of pressures on our roads then this weekend, Maddie. Yes, that's right. I mean, I am standing overlooking the M4, and it's likely to be one of the pinch points uh, for travellers today. There's two things going on here, really. The first is yesterday, schools broke up. It's the official start of the summer holiday season. Um, and the RAC has dubbed it, in fact, the Great Getaway, because it says nearly 19 million uh, leisure journeys will be made between now and Monday. That's more than at any time since 2014. And that's probably boosted, in part, because we've seen so much disruption at airports and with air travel over the summer. So you've got more people opting for staycations. Um, but sadly, the other thing is there, will, there is likely to be disruption. There's been warnings of disruption on the roads today because fuel price protesters are going to um, target motorways with flotillas of very slow-moving cars, big groups of slow-moving cars that will clog up the motorways here on the M4, but also the M32, the M5, to protest about the very high price of fuel at the moment. So it's a bit of a perfect storm if you're trying to get away. And we've already seen huge disruption for holidaymakers who are trying to uh, leave our shores. Um, down at Port of Dover, there have been three-hour queues for people trying to get through security and get checked in. So it's not going to be an easy weekend. Uh, and certainly, it's, the RAC has said roads across the country um, could become really congested. The advice is leave early if you can. Leave now. Leave before 10 o'clock in the morning or travel after 7 o'clock tonight to avoid the worst of that traffic. OK, lovely. Madeline, thanks very much indeed. And I am going to be talking to the RAC in a bit as well, so we'll, we'll get more words of wisdom from them too. Thanks very much indeed. Let's take a look now at some of the day's other headlines. And prisons across England and Wales will soon have specialised wings dedicated to treating drug addiction. The government has announced that it's putting £120 million worth of funding into the project, which will continue to support prisoners once they're released. More than 7 million payments of £326 have been made so far to help low-income households through the cost of living crisis, according to government figures. It means £2.4 billion has been paid from the support package, with the second instalment of £324 to be sent out later this year. One of the UK's most notorious prisoners, Charles Bronson, has become the first prisoner to formally ask for a public parole board. Reforms came into force yesterday, meaning parole hearings can take place in public for the first time. Bronson, who's been in prison for nearly 50 years, recently sent Sky News a voice message asking why he was still in jail. In Sri Lanka, organisers say at least 50 protesters have been injured and a number of journalists have reportedly been beaten by security forces as anti-government demonstrations continued overnight outside the president's office in Colombo. Earlier this week, Ranul Wickramasinghe was sworn in as the new president after months of economic and political turmoil. 100,000 monkeypox vaccinations have been produced in the UK as cases of the disease continue to rise. There are more than 2,000 cases in the country and campaigners want more people to get vaccinated. The UK Health and Security Agency predict about 50,000 people will need a vaccine. Uh, the British uh, Association of Sexual Health and HIV predict at least double that, if not higher. We reckon about 125,000 minimum. So this is a really good step forward. But keep ordering those vaccines and keep getting them into people's arms. 
Turkey says a deal has been reached with Russia to allow Ukraine to resume exports of grain through the Black Sea. It's set to be signed later today in Istanbul by officials from Ukraine, Russia, Turkey and the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. The world shortage of Ukrainian grain since Russia's invasion in February has left millions at risk of hunger. US President Joe Biden has tested positive for COVID. The White House says he's experiencing very mild symptoms and that he'll continue to carry out his duties while in isolation. Hey folks, guess you heard this morning I tested positive for COVID. But I've been double vaccinated, double boosted, symptoms are mild, and, uh, and I really appreciate your inquiries and your concerns. But I'm doing well, I'm getting a lot of work done, I'm gonna continue to get it done, and uh, and in the meantime, thanks for your concern and keep the faith. It's going to be OK. Now, the heat wave that's seen temperatures soar in parts of Western Europe shows no signs of relenting. Wildfires have swept across France, Spain and Portugal, with thousands forced to leave their homes. Despite having more of the infrastructure to cope with hot weather, some people fear that their homes may soon become unlivable. Well, Spain is already experiencing its worst year for wildfires in a decade, with more than 90,000 hectares of land burnt. Sky's Hannah Thomas-Peter reports from the villages of Obario and Avega de Cas Cascala. When the wildfires surged through the hills and towards the tiny village of Obario in Galicia, northwest Spain, it stood little chance. Not even the stone church, hundreds of years old, survived unscathed. Oh, no. Quedó nada, no quedó nada. Amparo Corcoba has come back to see what is left of her life. Mira, aún está saliendo el humo. The house is still smouldering and it's not safe to go back inside. She doesn't even know if they can salvage anything. Muy triste, muy triste. It's very sad, very sad indeed, she says. My husband inherited this house from his parents and he built this bit with his own hands when he was young to make it bigger. So for my husband, this really hurts him and it hurts me too. There is a crisis to recover from, but increasingly a bigger problem to think about too. As climate change gets worse, so will fire season putting these communities at risk over and over again. And it will make some people think about whether or not they want to stay here at all. In the neighboring village of Avega di Cascala, one family has had enough. It's the house that my father-in-law built and it's our family home, Lila Rodriguez tells me, but our intention is to sell it. It's a pity. But others, like Roberto Rodriguez, are more philosophical. As everything has already burned, he says, what is left to burn? I am old and retired. Where should I go? I still have a beautiful house. For the moment, that is true. But others weren't so lucky and must pick up the pieces. Facing an uncertain future, as the danger posed by climate change grows. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News in Galicia in Spain. Coming up on Sky News Breakfast, I'm going to be joined by a former US state senator and Democrat strategist to get more reaction to the Capitol riots hearings. That's coming up. Welcome back. You're watching the Sky News Breakfast. Now, in the last half an hour, the Conservative MP Robert Halfen has told this programme that his choice for party leader, Rishi Sunak, will close the gap on Liz Truss once he gets a chance to pitch his ideas to party members. He also told me that the former Chancellor isn't making taxation promises that he can't keep. I believe that when the, chan uh, the former Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, makes his case that more members will come and uh, support him because they know uh, that it, he's not making promises that he can't keep. And that's the important thing. If he wanted to be popular, he could say uh, everything and anything about tax cuts. Well, Rob is back with me now. And the context for this, of course, a, a poll which is not very pretty reading for Rishi Sunak this morning. Yeah, as we enter this second part of the membership 
um, contest, the leadership battle. Um, it shows that Liz Truss at the moment certainly appears to be the clear favourite. Uh, and the pitches are, are really very different. Whilst on the Truss side, you have talk of immediate tax cuts, cuts, a reversal of that national insurance rise from earlier this year, cuts to business tax, corporation taxes. The pitch from the Rishi Sunak side, actually, there's not a lot new on top of what was put out while he was Chancellor that is there. And, and, and I think the, the proposal, the proposition that you heard Rob Halfon setting out there is essentially, look, this may not sound as sort of eye-catching or exciting, but this is more realistic and this is more sensible and that you should trust me to put this through because I know what I'm doing, essentially. Now, the danger for that is that this YouGov poll shows that four in ten of the 700-odd Tory members that they surveyed said they didn't trust Rishi Sunak to tell the truth. So that suggests that he has got some work to do, bluntly, over the summer, probably on two fronts. To firstly convince people that he is a safer bet that he will not be putting forward unfunded tax cuts, that what he, he knows what he is doing and his opposite number doesn't. That's the first part. But bluntly, the second bit is probably offering something new. A couple of days ago, he wrote a piece in The Telegraph talking about putting forward radical reforms akin to the Thatcher years. Now, when you push Robert Halfon on exactly what they are, because he hasn't said anything specific, he didn't say anything. He, he just pointed to previous policy. So I think that you'd hope anyway, if you were a Rishi Sunak supporter, that there is something that he is holding back to try and get people on side, uh, along with essentially working on this issue of trust uh, and this, this question of, look, you might not like my message, but trust me that I know what I'm doing. I think that is the challenge for the coming weeks. But be in no doubt, uh, he is the underdog uh, at the moment. Um, uh, and I think uh, that's a remarkable state of affairs, looking back over the past previous months, where I think going back a few months, you would have probably assumed he would have been the favourite in this. But at the moment, it is Liz Truss that is leading the pack on this. Very interesting stuff. Yeah, Rob, thanks very much indeed. And we're going to be talking to a Liz Truss supporter very shortly as well. Now, critically endangered pine martins could be reintroduced to the southwest of England following a 150-year absence. Now, a coalition of conservation organisations, including the National Trust, hope that these nocturnal mammals, pictured here, could be released as early as autumn 2024. Now, pine martins used to be amongst Britain's most common mammals, but they were pushed to the brink of extinction in England due to a loss of habitat. To find out uh, their concerns, but also how we can work with them to resolve those. Uh, it's, we've already been in touch with over 70 organisations and groups, and we plan on working with them over the next year to 18 months to, to work through those concerns and issues and to make sure this is a successful reintroduction for them and for the animal. Do stay with us, still to come here on Sky News Breakfast. With the country set to embark on an estimated 19 million journeys by car as the school summer holidays start this weekend, I'll be speaking with the RAC about what we should expect on the roads. Climate change is with us and it's becoming critical. But the fight back is on. Coal is under fire, whereas wind power is booming. You can now have burgers made out of these rather than those. And no need for fuel, just rely on the vital spark. I'm Tom Heap and I'm joining Sky News for special weekend editions of The Climate Show, where we'll meet the people hit by the crisis and also those delivering crafty solutions. In the end, the question is, can we reach a world that isn't based on burning stuff? Find out on The Climate Show on Sky News. Now, as schools in England and Wales break up for the summer holidays, the RAC has predicted there's going to be close to 19 million leisure trips made by car over the coming weekend. It's the RAC's highest prediction for the summer term breakup weekend since 2014. So joining me now is Rod Dennis from the RAC. So why so busy? Over the next few days, it does look like it's kind of the continuation of the staycation summers that we've seen for the last two years. We do think perhaps some of the sort of the high prices, the sort of travel chaos actually involved in travelling abroad this year might be having an impact as well. Clearly, fuel price is still a big issue for people over here in the UK, but clearly, if you're going further afield, 
into Europe, that only sort of adds up in terms of adding on tolls and that sort of thing. So I think there is a kind of a, an acknowledgement from drivers that, yes, they want to get away on a trip, but perhaps stay more local this year makes a lot of sense still. So a huge number of people taking to the roads to go on holiday. I mean, to what extent is that picture complicated further by the fact that there could be some protests on our roads? Yeah, I'm afraid I think later on this morning into this afternoon, I think there is likely to be an impact. Um, our friends at INRIX, who provide all of all of the traffic data for us, do pinpoint that particular kind of stretch around what we call the Almondsbury Interchange. It's where the M4 and M5 motorways meet north of Bristol. That's a really important stretch for taking people from the West Midlands and from um, even from the southeast as well down towards the West Country. And there is likely to be some impacts on drivers heading sort of south there into the early part of the afternoon. Um, outside sort of that area, you know, the fuel protests don't appear to be affecting, for instance, the M25. And it's really the M25 this year that features as probably the road that appears to be picking up most of the congestion, a lot of problems we expect between Hertfordshire down to the M3 and between Bromley and the Dartford Crossing in the next few days as well. So uh, I think it's going to be a busy picture out there. The message for drivers is you've got to leave early. If you've not, if you're watching this and you haven't left yet, and you've got a long journey planned, I think expect it just to take longer than you would normally expect this time of year. It's really difficult for people, isn't it? Because they don't want to miss any of their holiday, but at the same time, they don't want to get spend the first day stuck in traffic. I mean, if everyone heeded your advice and left early, that you'd have you've have uh, queues of traffic on motorways earlier in the morning. How do people know when is the best time to leave? I think that's a fair point. I think we have to sort of acknowledge that in this country we have, you know, an important but still limited motorway network. The sort of places where people want to go, we know that every year the West Country, Devon and Cornwall tops the list for drivers' for sort of favourite locations. There are only a few means of actually getting there. It's the M5 and if you're heading from the home counties in London, it's the A303. And we know there's limited capacity on both of those roads when things get extremely busy. But then short of sort of driving in the middle of the night, which probably isn't particularly palatable for a lot of people, Getting away as early as you can is the best way of avoiding the queues. You're not going to perhaps avoid them completely, especially if you're traveling a long distance. But during the holidays, people tend to get up slightly later. They tend to get out onto the road slightly later as well. And it's that cumulative impact that leads to some of the problems that we tend to see. So again, you know, early bird catches the worm, I think is still the key byword, but you've got to get away early. I mean, super early to avoid those. And what about the risk of, of breakdown? I mean, the worst nightmare, stuck in traffic and then you break down on a motorway, causing even more chaos for those people behind you. Do you have any tips for people to avoid that risk? Absolutely. That's a great question. Our patrols will go out to about three quarters of a million separate breakdowns over the course of the next six weeks or so. A large proportion of those are avoidable. And I think this is frustrating for families when they find themselves involved in a breakdown. But there are things that you can do to reduce the chance of that happening in the first place. It takes you five, 10 minutes this morning. So under the bonnet with a cold engine, check your oil and coolant levels are where they should be. That only takes a few moments, but it's vitally important, especially when the traffic gets particularly heavy. Outside the vehicle, your tires, make sure they're free of damage and they've been um, inflated correctly. If you just follow those four quick, short steps, the chance of breaking down is reduced massively. So I would really urge everybody to try to do that this morning before they set out. So good advice on avoiding breakdown. What about good advo advice for avoiding family breakdown in a car? <laughs> <laughs> People with small yeah. children travelling a very long distance. I mean, do you, I, I, this is perhaps beyond your remit, but do you have any advice for people who are going to try and uh, want to make the journey as smooth as possible? Well, I think you have to kind of anticipate that it's going to be a long trip. You know, you may not be driving to France this summer, but if, even if you're just heading down to Devon or Cornwall, up to the Lake District, Yorkshire, wherever it may be, just expect your journey to take longer. Don't sort of trust the first estimate that your sat nav gives you and presume that you're going to be there. Add on a good kind of allowance into that an hour, maybe even a couple of hours. Just expect your journey to take longer. Plan in plenty of rest stops. Have some games, snacks, those sorts of things. Uh, at least the heat's cooled down. So, you know, if you're not in, a, in an air-conditioned car, at least sort of conditions on the road are slightly more comfortable. But as you say, you just don't want to be in the situation of having a breakdown because that clearly adds on a huge amount of time, stress and frustration for everybody. So try to avoid that if you possibly can. But, yeah, it's not going to be particularly easy of course the next few days, but at the same time, people are desperate to get away on their holidays. Um, you know, our patrols will be there to sort of help them on their way should they run into difficulty. But get away early, do your checks, and hopefully you'll have a reasonably st uh, straightforward trip. Well, Rod Dennis, we appreciate your advice. And uh, yes, I join you in wishing everyone very happy holes and uh, hope they don't get stuck in traffic queues Absolutely. for too long. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks.
And actually, in some traffic-related uh, news, uh, some breaking news in the last few minutes, Doug Bannister, who's the chief executive of the Port of Dover, has told Sky News that there's a critical incident going on at the port at the moment with extremely long queues there. Uh, let's get more on this. Um, our correspondent, Madeleine Radcliffe, uh, can pick up on this. Uh, she's covering the wider travel disruption for us this morning. But uh, news that uh, Port of Dover is struggling. Yes, thanks, Anna. The disruption starting slightly earlier than we, we'd thought or hoped, I suppose, for drivers today. That critical incident at Dover because of incredibly long queues forming there already. And as you said there, uh, the chief executive of the Port of Dover, Doug Bannister, has told Sky News that it's the cause of... The cause of the problem is the French. Their immigration controls there are not properly staffed, he said, and along with those staffing shortages and a, a longer transaction time, longer time for checks at the moment, that means there are already queues and a backlog uh, developing. And he says they feel incredibly let down because they've been planning for this day, the start of the summer holidays, for months, obviously, um, but it sadly is already going to be a, a tricky start for the day for those trying to get away on summer holidays with this critical incident and very long queues at Dover if you're trying to get over to France. Madeline, thanks very much indeed. So far, the traffic behind you looks fairly free-flowing, but uh, who knows how it will build up during the day. Madeline, thanks very much indeed. So that's the traffic news. What about the weather now? Let's take a look. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, the next few days will be fairly unsettled, but over the weekend, the southeast looks mainly fine and very warm. It's a largely dry start, but cloud over Britain is giving showery outbreaks of rain, especially across England and Wales. Britain will stay quite cloudy through the morning, with the best of any sunshine across the far southwest and Kent. Showery rain will develop more widely, with heavy and thundery downpours possible, especially in the south. Ireland and Northern Ireland will stay mainly fine. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And before we go this hour, a new photograph of Prince George has been released to mark his ninth birthday. The third in line to the throne is seen smiling on a beach. There he is, in an image that was captured by his mother, the Duchess of Cambridge, earlier on this month. So, happy birthday to him. Do stay with us. Coming up next on Sky News Breakfast, uh, more as a committee hearing has been told Donald Trump refused to call off the mob attacking the Capitol building in January, despite pleas from members of Congress and even his own family.